colleagues. So I'll do my best to make this interesting. Um, I don't have much, uh, as much data as, as the previous speaker did, but um, the basic story I want to tell is the following. Um, we're in China right now. Thank you for all for coming. We've heard a lot about China's ascent. China is an economic superpower. China is rising as a political superpower. China's military is becoming stronger and stronger. The US is expressing concerns over the expansion of China's military. So we've heard these stories, and they've been relatively well told. The story that I'd like to tell you today is about China as a technological superpower. And I believe that this story that of China as a technological superpower has been less well told. And I'd like to draw attention to that story. So basically, my, my presentation is about uh, the possibility of China becoming a technolo technological superpower and how and why that might be possible in the coming near future. Um, before, so the title of my talk was China as the world's technology leader. Um, so some of you may be thinking, how do I measure leadership? How, how do we define leadership? How do we understand whether a country is, is indeed a leader or not? F for the purposes of this paper, I used uh, four factors, two input statistics and two output statistics. Input statistics involve R&D intensity, how much money is being spent on research and development as a percentage of GDP, how many people there are conducting scientific and technological, um, are engaged in scientific and technological developments. Those are the two input statistics. The output statistics are the number of scientific publications, and finally, the number of patents. So if we take a snapshot, take a picture, like we have a camera, we take a snapshot look of China's innovation system, this is what we see as of around 2012, 2013. The rate of spending on R&D outpaces overall economic growth. So we all know that China has been growing very fast, but the rate at which they've been investing in research and development has even exceeded the rate at which they've been growing economically. In 2012, China spent 163 billion US dollars, or 1.98% of its growing GDP on research and development. This figure has since exceeded two. In 2013, it was 2.02, .02, which places it second in the world only to the US. It has 3.2 million R&D personnel in 2012. Second is the amount of money or the percentage of GDP? Amount of money. Amount of money. It has 3.2 million R&D personnel in 2012, and it now turns out the largest number of undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral students in science and engineering in the world. Over the period of 2001 to 2011, China ranked second in the world in research output as measured by the number of papers published by Chinese scientists in research journals. It's ranked seventh but rising in terms of citations for papers authored by Chinese scientists. In 2012, China trailed only the United States and Japan and Germany in patents filings under the Patent Corporation Treaty, PCT, administered by the World Intellectual Property Office. Two large uh, Chinese telecommunications equipment manufacturers in particular, ZTE and Huawei, they ranked first and third in worldwide ranking of top PCT applicants in 2012. At the US Patent and Trademark Office, the number of patent applications originating in China grew 18% from the period over the period 20, 2009 to 2010 a rate not matched by any other country. Despite this seemingly growing body of consensus that China is, is ascending in terms of its technological superiority, there exists considerable skepticism over, China, over China's capacity to attain global technological le leadership. And in the next two or three slides, I just list out some of this skepticism that has appeared in the popular press in academic literature from uh, individuals at MIT who wrote in Foreign Affairs, Chinese firms forego investment in long-term technology development. David Shambo of George Washington University in 2012 said that Chinese companies are still taking baby steps towards parity in global business. Dan Bresnitz and Michael Murphy, professors at Georgia Tech, argued in 2011 that Ch China has settled merely on keeping pace with technological advances elsewhere. Tom Friedman, who more of you are likely to, to recognize, the, a name that more of you are likely to recognize, argued in September 2012 that innovation depends on a culture of trust and that China has a huge trust deficit, a lingering remnant of Maoism. So despite some of these indicators that have been emerging, that China is ascending in terms of the amount of input it puts into science and technology and the amount of outputs it gets out of the science and technological system, there exists considerable skepticism. So I argue that the aforementioned skepticism overlooks several important factors that have positioned China to compete for global technological leadership. And basically, the story that I want to tell is, is, is related to those three, these three factors. These three factors, two of which 
we saw uh, emerge in the United States in the 1900s, and a third, which is a new one, I argue, combine to give China, to play, position China, to place China, so as to assume the mantle of global technological leader. So if we look at uh, technological leadership throughout history, I'll go through this very quickly because it's more historical. Basically, if we consider the period from the British Industrial Revolution onwards, 1760 to 1830, technology has been leveraged for competitiveness as well as economic and military leadership. So over the 70-year period of the British Industrial Revolution, obviously Great Britain industrialized very fast and they, invest, uh, they advanced very quickly, particularly in the iron, cotton, and steel industries. And the changes in these three industries acted as a trigger for further technological changes in associated industries. And the first World's Fair, for example, held in Crystal Palace in 1851, I have a little picture there, was in a magnificent glass building which showcased British technological leadership. After Britain, other countries in Europe began to industrialize Germany and France, um, being preeminent among those, and technology transfer from Great Britain played a leading role. From in the 1900s, the torch of tech global technological leadership shifted from Europe to the United States. And I think many of us would tend to agree that the United States is a global technological leader today. But as I would like to show in this presentation, it's being threatened by China. By the First World War, American firms, especially in chemical and electronic industries, has established first-class industrial R&D labs. And the establishment of these R&D labs sort of differentiated the United States' efforts into science, science and technology from previous European efforts. As these labs were insulated from more immediate corporate pressures to shop, solve shop for problems. They could focus on longer term issues and, and technologies. So the post-World War American dominance was due to advanced technology and the rise of large US corporations was noteworthy as they pioneered mass production techniques, the assembly line, standardized product, and the long production run. From the mid-1900s onwards, large US corporations developed a clear technological edge, edge in global production and trade. So in the catching up hypothesis, the United States is viewed as a leader and other countries as followers. However, as we know, American technological leadership has not remained uniformly strong throughout the 20th century. It was threatened in the 1980s by Japan. Um, Japan's focus on innovation and technological advance uh, propelled it into the leadership position within the Asian region, for sure. And it briefly threatens the global leadership held by the United States. The initial explanations to describe Japan's ascent focus simplistically on copying, imitating, and importing foreign technology. And I put this deliberately because these are many of the arguments that we now see applied to China, that they just copy, they merely copy, they merely import foreign technology, and they don't create any of their own technologies. But with the passage of time in relation to Japan, this explanation was no longer adequate. It gradually became clear that the correct explanatory factors were higher technological sophistication of new products and processes, rapid diffusion of new technology, and integration of research and development. After Japan, smaller countries have focused their attempts on taking a slice of the technological leadership pie. Uh, it's become fashionable over the last several decades for countries to invest heavily in, in research and development. And these nations that I list here, these economies that I list here, Israel, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, all invest three to 4% of, of their GDP on research and development. However, uh, there's no single country that has been able to challenge the hegemony of, United, of American global leadership in terms of science and technology. No country, perhaps, until China today. And the reason why China is positioned to make that challenge is because of these three reasons. In order to attain technological leadership, China has three distinct sources of competitive advantage. And I'll discuss each of these three. And that's the, that outlines the, rem the remaining slides of my presentation. Market size, governmental power, and globalization. Let's look at market size. Market size is obviously an important determinant of innovation activities. Greater the demand, greater the revenue, the more likely companies are to innovate because they are going to find consumers for the products that they create and more efficient the production processes, greater the aggregate cost savings. So companies are incentivized to introduce new products to reap increasing returns. And like I said earlier, this factor of a large domestic market was critical to the success of the United States in helping it 
to attain global technological leadership in the early 1900s. Following the Second World War, US companies also benefited from selling to the world's largest domestic market, at that time, the United States. These American firms led the world in developing and implementing leading edge technologies and claimed the largest worldwide share in many export goods. Resource and capital intensive US manufacturing firms operated on a much larger scale than their counterparts in Europe, anywhere in the world, in fact. And I, we think that similar dynamics will play out in the massive Chinese market. A large domestic market will mean that there will be a rise of large Chinese corporations who are going to help serve, help feed, help satisfy the demand of that large domestic market. And China already has strengths in mass production techniques. It's been known as the workshop of the world, able to adapt Western techniques to Chinese conditions. So we see many times, you know, you have an Apple product, ap Apple phone in, in the West. You have a similarly Xiaomi phone in, 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 in China. You have WhatsApp in the West. You have WeChat in China. Many examples of, of uh, eBay, Taobao, many examples of, of simultaneous, uh, creation of simultaneous products and services to serve um, much more um, finely the massive Chinese market. So China's emergence as a rapidly growing major market offers a unique advantage for technological advancement. The fact that they have access to this large market is a source um, of, of advantage, the likes of which no other nation, perhaps except the United States, has enjoyed up to this point. And the local Chinese firms, as I've just mentioned, are best situated, are best positioned to satisfy the tastes of the Chinese market in terms of Chinese consumers' expectations regarding price, quality, product features, and so on. So this, the integration of mass production strength with the world's second largest economy has led forecasters at various institutions, Goldman Sachs, Standard Chartered, The Economist, to predict that the Chinese economy will be twice as large as the US by 2030. I mean, these are predictions, and, and given the current situation, maybe these, these predictions won't come true. But uh, the, the fact is that we are seeing the emergence of large Chinese multinational firms who are um, primarily, sat some, of them, some of whom are only satisfying the domestic market, but others are also exporting overseas. So if these forecasts prove true, the capacity of Chinese firms to continuously leverage advantage of their home market to enhance the technological competitiveness will be a major success factor. The second of the three competitive advantages is governmental power. So on the way to becoming global technological leaders, Chinese companies have benefited significantly, as we know, from the Chinese government's industrial policy. They've favored large state-owned enterprises um, who receive a lot, of, a lot of assistance from the Chinese government. The Chinese government's industrial policy is unmatched in scale and strength by Western standards. In fact, China has adopted the US model to boost their own state-backed R&D investment. So when it comes to innovation, when it comes to scientific and technological development, I argue that it's necessary to have a strong government. Um, and I always contrast what's happening in mainland China with, with what's happening in, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is known as a beacon for, of positive non-interventionism, laissez-faire, hands-off, big market, small government. And here we have very low levels of, of activity in science and technology. But it's, it's different in, the, in, in China. And not only is it different in China, but what we see in China is what we saw in the United States in the mid-1900s. The success of high-tech industries in the US in the post-war era reflected massive private and public investments in research and development, scientific and technical, technical education, not least the establishment of land-grant universities. Given the Chinese autocratic system of governance, China is able to steer Chinese state-owned and private companies to increase their R&D investments. So since 2006, as I will show you in, in a few moments, China has, has um, forced the state-owned enterprises to be the leaders in terms of the sector which invests the most in terms of research and development. So this has been reflected in the amount of money spent on R&D in China. So the use of industrial policy to help domestic companies upgrade um, has its roots in the Hamiltonian economic philosophy, which holds that a big country needs big organizations to succeed and that the federal government should partner with private enterprise to finance scientific research and provide resources and infrastructure that businesses lack. And this is from the United States. Exactly 
well, not exactly. It's, it's very, what China is doing is very similar to what the United States did in the mid-1900s. Under this approach, the American government sponsored projects such as the Erie Canal, Transcontinental Railroad, land-grant universities, and network of airports. And this helped create within the United States a huge interconnected marketplace, which allowed the flourishing of companies such as Standard Oil, General Motors, U.S. Steel, General Electric, Sears Roebuck, and so on and so forth. The U.S. government and the, and the U.S. military led the way in financing innovation in its early stages. And as we know, government finance, research and procurement fueled industries that produced hy the hybrid seed, the radar, synthetic rubber, microchip, GPS, and the internet. Okay. And most of the centralized power that enabled China to run a planned economy remains firmly in place. Government is able to play a significant role in shaping increasingly market-oriented activities. And this factor is unmatched by Western economies today. The Chinese government has much more, as a result of which, Chinese government has much more policy instruments at its disposal than do its Western counterparts. They want to make a dam, they will make a dam. They'll put people away, they will shift uh, mountains, and they will make a dam if they want to make a dam. It enables the government to facilitate technological learning on on the part of indigenous local firms. With these beneficial policies, China, the Chinese government has bolstered the wind turbine industry um, and strategic emerging technologies, which include environmental technology, telecommunications, biotech, advanced manufacturing, and re renewable energy, advanced material, and green vehicles. And some of these policies include large-scale government grants, tax concessions, tax concessions, easy access to bank loans, policy, policies regarding intellectual property, standardization, and so forth. So China is the second largest performer, as I've said already, of R&D globally, accounting for 12% of the total, but it's still quite a bit behind the United States, which is at 31%. The pace, however, of real growth in China's overall R&D expenditure over the period 1999 to 2009 has been exceptionally high at 20% annually. And the point that I wanted to make earlier was regarding this national mid to long term plan for science and technology development, 2006 to 2020. In 2006, China, the, uh, the Chinese government embarked on this plan, which will take it to 2020, which demonstrates remarkable foresight for what is an emerging economy, for a developing economy. How come the Brazils and the Russias and the South Africas of this world haven't engaged in, in this sort of a plan? I mean, it's unmatched in scale and scope. In the plan, R&D expenditure to GDP ratio is to be raised to 2.5%. Um, the plan proposes indig indigenous innovation and it represents the leadership's ambition to sustain economic growth and so forth. There is, of course, concern in the US and elsewhere that Beijing's visible hand is giving China an unfair advantage because, of Ch because China is not f playing fairly by the rules, by the rules of international trade. And this, too, is a symptom of the Chinese government's style of governance, where a heavy hand combined with secrecy prevails. OK, the final competitive advantage that China has is globalization. And this is different from what the U United States had. The United States had a large, a large domestic market, um, a strong government, but it didn't have, um, it wasn't able to exploit or leverage the forces of globalization. In a globalized era, Chinese companies need, need not develop every cutting edge technology on their own. Rather, they can undertake mergers and acquisitions as a deliberate strategy for acquiring advanced technologies owned by foreign firms. It's a, it's a mechanism for them to advance much more quickly than they would otherwise. As early as the 10th five-year plan, which was in 2001 to 2005, Chinese government un unveiled its Go Global strategy to encourage outward foreign direct investment. And China's outward foreign direct investment accelerated after 2009. In 2010, um, China's outward FDI amounted to 68 billion, ranking it fifth in the world. And the goal of some, not all, but many of these outward FDI projects has been the acquisition of advanced technology. And I'm just going to give you some illustrative examples, and I'll end with my conclusions. Lenovo struck two deals in close succession in 2014. It bought IBM's low-end server business. It bought Google's Motorola handset division and to remodel Lenovo as a force in mobile devices. Beijing Automotive Industry Holding Company acquired the intellectual property rights affiliated with Saab Motors and Engines. And their objective was to integrate Saab's technology into its future R&D in order to create an indigenous BAIC vehicle, which was launched in September 2014. Another car maker, Geely, completed the acquisition of, of Swedish automaker Volvo from Ford Motors in 2010. Geely needed Volvo's technology in, in order to improve its own quality. And it owns all of Volvo's key technologies and intellectual property right. So the IPR ownership represents a core value of this acquisition. In aviation, China Aviation Industry General Aircraft 
largest general aircraft, general aircraft manufacturer in China acquired Cirrus aircraft. And the idea is to build a new single jet vision jet. In renewable energy, Sinovel, um, R&D alliance between China, Sinovel, and US-based Wintech allowed Sinovel to produce five and six megawatt turbines in 2010 and 2011. Another example here. In machinery, Sani Group, China's largest construction equipment maker, acquired a German company, a mid-sized German company, in January 2012 for its cutting-edge technology. In energy, CNOC acquired Canadian um, producer Nexon, and, and Sinopec purchased North Sea operations of Talisman Energy. And this provides Chinese firms with advanced production technologies to draw oil and gas from non-traditional areas such as deep water fields and hardened rock forma formations more efficiently. So to end, some implications for emerging markets. There exist plentiful opportunities for emerging market firms to partner with or invest in Chinese firms and R&D facilities. Executives in emerging markets should expand their horizons beyond the traditional science and technology superpowers of the US, Japan, and Germany. In China, opportunities will abound in industry and academia for cooperation in science and technology, for investment in R&D partnerships, for sourcing technolo technologically sophisticated manufacturing components. Not only will emerging market firms find it cheaper to move into China, since some of them are Asian, they will also find more cultural affinities there. And this is a, a, a comment that has, made, but has been made by earlier speakers as well. Knowledge and products that result from such cooperation will be closer to market for domestic consumption. And EM firms that partner with Chinese firms uh, will be able to take advantage of China's growing and improving science and technology infrastructure. Okay, finally, to, to conclude, basic idea of this presentation is that too few in policymaking and financial circles anticipate the rise of Chinese multinationals to the position of global technological leadership. To be sure, many Chinese, some Chinese companies have benefited enormously from monopolies granted by Beijing, and continuous improvement of Chinese firms' technological strength relies on the political stability in the country. However, more of this technological rise can be attributed to the three factors that I, I mentioned. Combined and individually, these three factors will explain how and why Chinese companies will move beyond the traditional reliance on low-factor input costs to scale the value-added chain. The mergers and acquisition cases are particularly insightful because they indicate the extent to which technology transfer to China is now taking place across a broad swathe of industries, not just in one particular industry. In the past, Chinese companies had to be content with acquiring technology, and this is my last slide, through license agreements or joint ventures with foreign partners. And many times, these arrangements limited the use of technology by Chinese firms. This was a major complaint made by Chinese partners in, in mainland China, that we are doing, we're engaging in joint ventures and, and, and license agreements where we don't get the technology. When a Chinese company acquires an overseas counterpart outright, however, it, under, it owns the underlying technology, and it can use the technology as it wishes, domestically or internationally. And finally, overseas acquisitions represent a point of pride in China, showcasing, showcasing its rising economic strength, signaling both Chinese triumph and the decline of its Western counterparts. That's all. Thank you. That was a fascinating presentation, Nobar. Uh, uh, I have a question that sort of tries to relate this also with the previous presentation. Uh, so would you advise emerging market countries to then uh, have uh, a lot of government involvement in technology? And I'm asking this question in particular because um, uh, you pointed out about the U.S. technological leadership that came about in the 19th century. And uh, uh, Chandler has shown that it was not just technology in the sense of uh, the patents, but rather also organizational innovations. Mm -hmm. And that is a theme that runs through the IT uh, investments and the productivity of IT initially was not seen in the productivity statistics, but uh, as firms became competent to, uh, as they made complementary investments to harness that technology, it was only then that the um, uh, growth showed in the productivity statistics. Yeah. So, so uh, w w what would you say about how uh, firstly, whether that is important, and secondly, if that is important, then how does government incentive? Uh, how does government make sure that firms become capable of 
deploying that technology. Right. So earlier you asked whether emerging market firms, uh, emerging market governments should should invest in science and technology, and uh, I think the best way to answer that is is historically. If you look at many of these uh, countries that I mentioned, not just the United States and Great Britain, but the Israel's, the Japan's, the Korea's, in all of these countries, the government and the beginning stages of the development of its innovation system has invested heavily. Over time, that investment decreases, and simultaneously, the investment by private firms increases with the passage of time. So that's been a pattern that we've seen for all of these smaller countries and even bigger countries. Now, the second question as to how to incentivize firms to engage not only in technological innovations, but organizational innovations, that's more of a, it, it's more, it depends on from industry to industry, um, product cycle, um, and I think there are various mechanisms there. But the key point, I think, is, is what I just said earlier, that in the early stages of the development of an innovation system, and I use the term innovation system because it's, it's different from an economic system. So, for example, in Hong Kong, we have a fantastic economic system, first, first world economy, good standards of living, high GDP per capita, and so on and so forth. Everything is, is well and dandy. But in terms of its innovation system, it's not mature at all. It's an extremely nascent and immature and developing innovation system. So for the development of an innovation system, government intervention, especially in the early stages, is, has been shown historically to be a, an extremely important factor. And, and the mechanisms vary depending on industry to industry. Sorry. Thank you very much uh, you. for a perfect presentation. Actually, I was... I'm the one who you addressed first. I'm the one who hit severely by the jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps I missed something. <laughs> I'm sorry for that in advance. But um, uh, two questions. First, when you talk about uh, technological innovations or R&D, yeah. so uh, w what is it about exactly? So there are disruptive innovations, yeah. there are incremental innovations, there are bottom of the pyramid of frugal innovations. Yeah. So they make cons completely different impact yeah. on the product, on, on what, 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 whatever happens. So yeah. what are the innovations uh, on, uh, in, and the other, th the other question is, um, so it's uh, about m kind of uh, commercialization or monetization, how they, how do China or Chinese firm uh, monetize those, uh, those innovations? Where do they, we know where they spend money, but where they earn money? Uh, because of that. Thank you. Uh, so the first question, what kind of innovations I'm talking about, I think I cover the whole gamut of innovations, and uh, from incremental to, to, to disruptive and so forth. And I think one of the criticisms that you can make of, of, these, of this picture that I'm painting is the following, that Chinese firms, the patents that they take out are for incremental and, and minor innovations, minor modifications, whereas the breakthrough technologies are still coming from the West. And that indeed is true. Um, but the way I see it is, is, um, is this, the metaphor that I like to use is, is if you're very hungry, you don't care what food you get. You get bread, it's fine. Once your tummy's full, then you want some fish and some meat and you want to go to higher quality. I think the stage at which China is at now is it's just quantity, not quality. It's quantity, just sheer numbers, investing as much money as they can, getting as many publications, applying for as many patents, and many of those patents mm. are useless. And for the, even for the useful ones, they're more on the incremental side. However, I think with the passage of time, they will come uh, a, a shift where they move their, they shift their attention to, to the real disruptive, as you mentioned, type of innovations. How are the Chinese firms monetizing the innovations? I think um, previously by exporting, they were, they were, all the value would go to the, to the overseas, like for example, the Apple they would make most of the money out of an Apple iPhone rather than the Chinese domestic manufacturer making much of that money. So um, they were monetizing it previously through exports, but now increasingly th to the local market. As the middle class um, expands and increases, they are, uh, many Chinese companies only sell locally and do not sell abroad. Yeah. Microphone here. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the aspects of innovation and R and D in the U S yes. uh, uh, was about it being led by universities and yes. education, yes. Uh, and I don't see that in China as yes. much. And the other thing is uh, uh, post World War II, means U S will have 
invaded or created wars, yes. more than 60 plus wars. And, and this whole defense equipment, uh, US Army involvement in R&D, because those also help fund uh, many of the research projects, including the internet. And yes, yes, yes. Uh, again, th that part is missing in sure. China. So, sure. so clearly so, those two drivers uh, played a huge role in the US. Right, uh, I, I agree that uh, in terms of the military, the Chinese military is not probably contributing as much as, a, anywhere near as much as the US military did. However, in terms of universities and education, um, and I'm sure there are other experts in the room who can, who can supplement my comments, but they've been moving to create world-class universities, to try and make universities a stronger component of the innovation system, trying upgrading the level of universities, access to universities by, for, for its uh, population, but also improving the quality of the universities. In terms of basic research? Uh, so, for, in terms of basic research and applied research, not just for universities, but the whole of Chinese innovation system is skewed towards applied research. They make products, they make things, and that is their bias. They don't engage in as much basic research, sort of blue sky thinking that might not have any, any commercial applications now, but something might come but 20 years later. That is something that the US was, was well renowned for and continues to be well renowned for. In China, at this point, the, the bias, the prejudice is towards applied research. So, and that, is, that, is, that comment is relevant to the entire innovation, so to the companies, to the government, and to universities. But that said, they are, creating, they are attempting to create more and more world-class universities. Um, this is just picking up on a point that was earlier made. Do you, do you have, uh, I thought one of the sources of criticism uh, about Chinese uh, maybe rising technological leadership was on qualitative grounds, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, lots of them like Dan Bresnitz, for example, I think believe that it's not qualitatively similar. Right, so uh, uh, my question is, can you sort of address how Chinese innovations have emerged uh, qualitatively over a period of time? Do you have any way to say that? Because these are just raw pattern numbers, right? I mean, at the end of the day, sure, these, I sure. mean, it partially addresses yeah. sort of your answer, quality versus yeah. quality before. But I was just wondering if you have any kind of evidence that suggests that these are qualitatively different today relative to maybe a, a few years back. No, in fact, I would, my answer to that question would be the, 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 the inverse, that it's, it's not, not only is it not qualitatively different, but it's just mimicking and copying, and much of the innovations that they do, like the patents, the, the answer that I gave to the early question, the patents that they take out are either useless or just very incremental in nature, and they're not sort of breakthrough patents. One, one thing that happened when Steve Jobs passed away was there's a lot of discussion in the, on the Chinese forums, the netizens were asking, when, why don't we have a Steve Jobs in 1.3 billion people? When are we going to have our Steve Jobs? So it was basically that question. How, how can we uh, differentiate ourselves qualitatively from, from the type of innovation that we're currently doing? So the Steve Jobs type of breakthrough, cutting edge, leading type of innovations, and they don't have that yet now. And the other thing that one of the criticisms that many people point to is that there's no Chinese product that you can point to and say, look, this is something the equivalent of a, of a computer or a phone made in China completely that is, is, is done by China, thought up by China, made in China, and assembled, produced everything in China. There's, there's not that exemplar artifact to but point to. What does to. that mean to technological leadership of China? I think what it means now is that in the phase that they are, they are still in the phase where they're just simply trying to catch up. And they're using these strategies, especially the, the, globalize, the exploding globalization, as a strategy to catch up much more quickly. And once they get to that level, I believe the effort will be much more concerted. It's like a student. It's easy to get an, uh, it's easy to pass a course. It's easy to get, a, relatively easy to get an A grade. But from getting from an A to an A plus, you have much more marginal effort to scale the, the highest points of the mountain. And I think that they haven't reached that yet. They're just trying to get up to the midpoint. Uh, it is with uh, very much uh, interest that I listen to your presentation because a lot of things that uh, you mentioned, I actually observe them in my research. And uh, since uh, I focus on uh, mid-sized, smaller companies, I often ask myself, like in China, when we talk about innovation, do we, uh, because I, I, I don't have, um, 
a picture of it yet. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you know, where does the innovation take place in China? Like, is it large companies? Are they private? Are they state-owned? Uh, are these uh, emerging small businesses? Because if we compare to the US, a lot of innovation, like really disruptive innovation in the US takes place in small startups, which are later acquired by large companies. So do we know these dynamics in, in China? Yeah, mostly large companies, mostly state-owned companies. That's where all the tax, uh, that's all where the grants and the tax concessions go, and they exploit it massively. And if there's one thing that they, China could do to redress that is to focus more on the small and medium-sized companies, because they don't get any support at all. Here we're in Hong Kong, which is the southern part of China, and in Guangdong province, many companies are going out of business, because Guangdong province wants to be environmentally clean, is, is making labor laws tighter, you have to pay your wage, your workers much more money. So the companies are forced to innovate, and very few of them are able to innovate because they're small to medium size. It's those large companies in Shanghai and Beijing, in um, telecommunications, in energy, in renewable energy that are driving all of this innovation effort. Yeah. So that's a qualitative difference as well. Okay, last question. I don't know if it's a good sign or bad sign. I'm getting so many questions. Um, uh, on the issue of importing the technologies, yes. um, Chinese have a massive diaspora all across the world. Yes. And po probably this is a resource of competences and knowledge. And as far as I remember, there were five or six Nobel laureates of Chinese origin from in physics and chemistry, and none of them were born in, in mainland China. Uh, so, and uh, do they work systematically to bring back the, or somehow use this, this pool of resources? Yes, absolutely. And I think um, uh, Albert mentioned one of our colleagues, one of our, another faculty associate, David Zweig, works on this topic where they're trying to attract back. They have the, what is it, a th 100 talent or a 1,000 talent scheme. Um, they have a number of schemes whereby they give a lot of monetary and other incentives to the highest ranked scientists and engineers in the West to attract them back to come to the China and do their uh, research in China and uh, to, to live in China. And it's had mixed success. Some of them come and stay. Others come and stay and then return. But the fact is that they realize that this diaspora is an important avenue to um, attain intellectual um, uh, competitiveness. So, uh, Anand.